Oh, God. I'm, I apologize. This is what happens when you have to use a computer that's not your own. There we go. Hi. So, um, I'm Joyce Ketterer. I'm this... What the hell? <laughs> um, I have to hit play. That will help. I am the CEO of Darden Studio and not a lawyer. So everything I am about to say is from the foundry and sales perspective. Uh, my opinions are formed by conversations with customers and our attorney, but should not be construed as legal advice. So that's our topic. And as the CEO of a small independent foundry with very few resellers, we're really responsible for a lot. And the most important thing I do is deal with the license and manage customer interactions with the license. We all know, or at least we say we know, that the license is the backbone of our business model. Most foundries say something on their website along the lines of, you're buying a license, not a font. So in a way, the license is the product, at least as much as the font is. Anyone who uses the construct of an industry standard talking about fonts is engaging in a lot of oversimplifications now to do that. For years, the industry has been working towards a more user-friendly model for licensing, mostly talking about the actual language in the desktop EULA, but there have been other efforts. And I'm going to present a, a different way to manage the documents that are associated with the menu of licensing options customers encounter. I don't want to imply that these ideas are unique to Darden Studio. Others have been working on them too. But it's fair to say they haven't reached the dominant culture. So it is a vast menu of options that customers encounter these days, especially if we just make a list of everything that is available from every foundry, not thinking about what any individual foundry offers. And much of the way licensing currently works, the actual documenting of that currently works, is a whole different from a simpler time before that was the case, and especially before embedding was a thing. There was a time when we didn't license fonts. We, as an industry, sold pieces of metal, and there are ways in which our culture still acts like that. Then, in the upheaval, which is frankly what brought most of us in the room into the industry, there was additional chaos because web fonts entered the scene, and then application embedding, and now who knows what else. My talk is about how to handle the pile of paperwork associated with those options. So last year, I did a similar talk on EULAs, and I presented my philosophy toward how to write the desktop EULA. I'm proud of it. It's on YouTube. I hope you'll go watch it. For those of you who remember it, who were here, or who already watched it, bear with me. I have to hit a few highlights. So, no one reads the EULA. And that's not going to change. Grieve that dream. It's very tempting to think of the people who violate our licenses as crooks, thieves, pirates. But the truth of the matter is that a great deal of license infringement comes from misunderstanding. In a broader software system set up that for font licenses to simply fail, customers are trained not to read EULAs, our own lawyer, doesn't read EULAs when she installs software on her computer. And con in contrast to most of the software industry, our software can't protect itself, even in the most basic ways, which is something customers have come to expect from software. They believe they are permitted to do anything they are physically capable of doing without cracking the software. And the truth of the matter is that most companies who violate, violate are actually, in addition, 
to being kind of in a system that isn't set up for this, disorganized messes. The difference, though, between a sloppy actor and the reason I like to talk about sloppy actors and a pirate is that the sloppy actor will work with you to put things right when you tell them they've done something wrong just so long as they feel that you're being fair. And so we put a lot of energy into making sure they feel that way. I, my philosophy falls into this one nutshell, right for the retroactive reader. That's the person who is reading the license after they have been told that they violated it. And so the key is that there should be no feelings that there were traps there, that there is anything about the system of licenses that was inaccessible to them or that they could believe were designed to confuse them. Last year I talked about how that philosophy relates to writing the desktop license. And this year I'm going to talk about how that relates to the series of documents that are needed to address that. So, there's a new paradigm that's starting to get traction and we'll call it the atomic model. Everyone already refers to the desktop license as the EULA. And under the atomic model, we double down on that, and the EULA becomes the nucleus. The, the desktop EULA becomes the nucleus, to which we can add addenda. And I'll get to the details of that in a minute. But for now, this, this is a client who needs web embedding. And this is a client who needs web, app, distribution, a period of exclusivity for a custom font. Complicated, huh? There's a way to manage that. Let's step back and see how many of us in the industry are issuing these documents. So imagine this is your EULA. It's several pages long. The first bit covers the, the use that's permitted under the font, that's the sexy stuff. Later, there's a lot of other stuff too, a lot of text that we refer to as legalese, which is a word I tried to come up with a synonym for because it's derogatory, but there just isn't one. It's an accurate word and we all demonize it anyway. It's not sexy, but it's crucial. It's the difference between a successful EULA and a failed one. And this is your self-hosted web font license. It was written with the idea that it might be bought independently from the desktop license, which, frankly, was probably never as common as we thought it was. In my experience, most licensees have a desktop license plus. There are some. So it's essentially the same document with edits. Here, the new stuff is illustrated with red highlighting. There's some new content, and there's some content that's gone. But most frequently, it's just the word font swapped out for the word web font. Four pages of this. But there really isn't that much that's different. So by the time you get to the end, there's very little that's new. And if I'm a client, what I care about when I look at different options on a store is I want to know what's different from this one than that one, which one should I buy? This license doesn't help me to understand that. And let's remember that the client isn't looking at one that's been marked up like I have here. They can't find these changes easily. If I'm the client, I stopped reading at the first page. Under the atomic model, everything is different. The atomic model has the same desktop license, which everyone has to have, but most customers are going to have anyway. And then, it is one page, a one-page document, which covers only the new things. 
This is easier for customers to read, and I have reason to believe, based on the questions they ask us, that they're more likely to read it. It makes it clear to the customer what they're getting from the web license, which is very important from uh, the perspective of making them feel uh, well served by us. And in our addenda, we actually refer to sections that change to encourage them to read the EULA if they haven't. So each paragraph starts off with paragraphs A, B, C are hereby modified to permit subsetting or whatever. And, it, and obviously there are other ways to, to do this, but if you call out what's different, it reinforces the relationship between the addenda and the EULA in a positive way. And this document structure is also better for the retroactive reader in a license enforcement because it's easier to read even in a compromised mental state, which creates less hostility. And there's also this wonderful side effect, which when you have a negotiated license, either for a very large retail sale where they want some bells and whistles you don't normally offer, or in a custom project, you can, you're not having to negotiate a whole new contract. You can work from the desktop license and then add a miscellaneous addenda, addendum, sorry, a miscellaneous addendum. Uh, that's less work, which saves legal fees. And three years down the road, when you've forgotten what you agreed to because it's been three years and the clients had some turnover, you can easily answer their questions about what they're permitted. But the atomic model isn't just logical, it's also much closer to what, how other industries operate. The insurance industry in the US does something very similar, which they call riders. In fact, you don't have to call them addenda. You could call them riders or amendments. There are probably other words I hadn't thought of. So in large-scale sales, or even just generally, you know, we're interacting with people in all sorts of industries. If we're functioning in the same paradigm as them, there's less, less friction, and it's easier for them to work with us. They don't get frustrated as quickly. So the moral here is that using addenda lead to less sales friction and a more friendly licensing, and more friendly license enforcement. And that's my Twitter handle at the bottom. And that really was everything. It was, wasn't 10 minutes, it was 12 minutes. But my intent is to start a conversation. And uh, if my feelings will not be hurt if, I, if we don't get questions. I want to start if anybody has questions and then if those are dispensed with, if anybody has comments. Um, and if, if, that, if, this, if this experiment doesn't work, that's fine. You can find me later. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Or a comment if there's no questions, as Jay said. Well, no, so let's start with questions. If you have a comment, let's, okay. So this question is coming from the perspective of a graphic designer, not as a type designer, but do you, have you heard of ideal ways that design clients organize and track and keep how they organize the EULAs? So then if you were to say, um, I need you to show documentation of licensing this font five years ago, how, how do other people organize those EULAs? On the sell side or on the buy on side? On the buy side. They don't. They don't. <laughs> um, Every once in a while, if there's a digital librarian, there's a good list. But lots of companies that don't have digital librarians, it was stored by the person who made the purchase, and if they're gone, it's gone. Unfortunately. I, we, we, you know, we do everything we can to discourage that, but we can't control them. Do you organize your... your um licenses or EULAs with a two-tiered information system like is this is the main point and then here's the fine point under it. Pretty much. Good. Yeah. Anybody else? 
I think this is sort of admittedly a bit in the weeds, but with regards to the web licensing, we had mm -hmm. a circumstance recently where a client wanted to bring a typeface into a specific page on their site, very, you know, a particular yeah. landing page. And, and there was a bit of a dilemma for us. We knew it wasn't licensed. We pushed back on that. We helped them get a license. Then the question became, what kind of license do they need when they're using it in this particular manner, not site-wide? And that sort of fell into a gray area, and I wasn't really quite sure how to answer it. And since I haven't had a chance to go back to that vendor yet, I don't want to say who it is, but um, that was a bit of a dilemma for me. I mean, I've been yeah. dealing with licensing stuff for the web for a long time, but it's always been across a whole site. And I felt like this was a bit of a hole in trying to sort out fair usage. Yeah, I don't think it's simple. And I, you know, it's not something that we've really solved. It's a case-by-case -case basis when these things come up. And we make the decision based on how put together we think the client is and how capable we think they are of sticking to their original intent. Because one of the things that happens all the time is fonts start in a tiny back area of a website and then they move. So, yeah, I don't have a clean answer for you. But weedsy questions are very welcome, or even, I think this is the last question, and then if we have comments. I, I love the weeds. I'm a wonky person. So, yeah? Um, I was wondering what are the most common addenda things that you end up including in custom licenses? Um, and maybe if I could just kind of get you talking a little bit on some of the stances that your license takes at other, other licenses don't take, things that you allow that it's common that other people don't allow, um, just some of your insights on some of those strategic decisions you've made, um, and also what you would think about a um, shopping cart system where you could just buy the license addenda, as, you could just add them to your cart. Like, what would you think of that? So I'm going to take those in two pieces. Please. So uh, the first one was what do, what do we... What are the most common addenda? So for those of you who were at my first lecture, you will know that we believe in a, a simple defining principle for the EULA with, the, with as few exceptions and caveats as possible. So for us, we say that if, it's embed, if the font is embedded in other software, it requires additional licensing, and if it isn't, it doesn't. So that means logos are permitted. That means uh, product use is permitted. Though we do forbid uh, font product, you know, t letter form products because we retain, we hold that back for us if we ever want to do it. But, and it's just forbidden. It's not available as an addendum. But, so there are a lot of things that other people probably are issuing license, uh, addenda for like, Broadcast and um, and uh, web, um, not web, uh, logo that we don't concern ourselves with. Uh, the most it, we also don't do EPUB um, because what we do is we just push EPUB over to PDF embedding um, because it's essentially still at this point PDF embedding. And uh, we just don't make a distinction. Um, so the most common uh, types of addenda that we issue are the three that are available to be seen on our website, uh, web, app, and distribution. And I don't know if distribution is something other people have, but it is a an addendum that allows a, a client, a, a, the, the end client to this, to cover their contractors with a license. So, um, and, and that is quite popular. Uh, the, then the other question, what was the other question, Luke? It was like, what would you think of? Oh, having it on the web. Yeah, so I would love to do that. And there are some barriers to it because um, we're, we believe that we're, we're only willing to enter into a contract 
with the entity that owns, and I, by own I mean literally own, not in the colloquial way that web developers will talk about, they own a project, but literally the owner who cannot be fired, who owns the URL in question or the app in question. And uh, that's something right now that customers aren't immediately familiar with. And so we're adding friction to make sure that the license is in the right name. And, and it is covered on our desktop license that 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 is required, but it's, it's not super simple. And we may one day add something to our website that, you know, gets them to certis certify that the, the, the named licensee is the owner of the associated brand for the license. That's not something we've done yet. I, I do want to move in that direction. Are we, are we time, at time? We're at time, yeah. Okay. Uh, I know there's a few extra questions, but we are out of time. Uh, conversation to continue, I'm sure. Um, thank you very much, Joyce. Give her a hand. Thank you. I don't know what to say. Sorry.